Okay, uh, so let's start our lecture. Um, so we are still in the topic of fair division. Uh, let me remind you uh, where where we are. Okay, so uh, overall, the question was this. Right, uh, this question was showed up in the previous lecture. So is there a best way to divide a collection of things among a group of people so that everyone is satisfied? So this is the topic of fair division. You want to divide something so that uh, everybody involved was happy. Right? So that's the question. So last time we have seen uh, several algorithms. So they handle uh, something we call divisible case. Uh, divisible means the object you want to divide uh, can be chopped off a tiny piece or so so you can you can you can cut off whatever way you want to cut uh, so the typical example they use cake they always use cake somehow cake was i don't know it's easy to cut and uh, maybe you can uh, put them back and cut again uh, so so that's that's the divisible case, right? Uh, now, for example, the, uh, you can also use land or use cake, uh, et cetera, to, to do that. Okay, now, how about those cases which are not divisible? So something you cannot cut into pieces. Uh, so how about we call it indivisible cases? So the typical examples like paintings or cars or house, or, um, for example, painting, well, is a crime, right? If you cut a masterpiece into smaller uh, pieces, okay. Okay, so, so can we have a, a way to divide those things? Well, obviously we need to, to, to have some extra assumption, right? Because, uh, for example, a, a Suppose we want to divide two cars, or we want to divide one painting among three, three people. It's certainly impossible. Uh, <laughs> only one piece, and three person want to uh, get it. So, so it's impossible. So we have to think of some other ways. Uh, we need to add some extra assumptions, right, to solve the problem. So, so but the question was quite interesting. Okay, so today we are going to have two, uh, we, we are going to see two algorithms. Um, one algorithm is uh, obviously uh, developed by Knaster. Uh, we mentioned his name uh, last in the last lecture. So, uh, so the algorithm is called the Knaster Inheritance Procedure. So the the scenario was set. Yes. Okay. So the scenario was set uh, like this. Uh, so two or more ears just inherit a house and they want to divide it fairly, right? So, so, it, so it's an inheritance because the typical story was along these lines. Okay, so, so we want to uh, help them to divide fairly. Now, obviously, they can't just, just cut and say, you know. Okay, so Knaster figured out a way to keep the house intact and still have all ears feel like they receive a fair share. Okay, how does he do it? So, but it assumed all players have a lot of money. You know. So if you have lots of money and somehow this system is either give you a portion of, of a house or, or something, or they give you compensation, um, compensation in terms of money. Okay. So, so that's the extra assumption. Okay. So we'll see how it works. Okay. So uh, a nice feature of this method is that every player in the game end up with more than a fair share. Right? That's even better, more than a fair share in their own eyes. Okay, we'll see how it works. So, uh, so this, okay, so let's, I hope the 
pointer still work, and I want to move out here. Okay, so, so let's use an example to illustrate this, this algorithm. Uh, so the algorithm has another name called a sealed bit. You will see the, the reason in a, in a second. Okay, so three heirs, uh, A, B, C, right? Alice, Betty, and Charles inherit an um, estate consisting of a house, a painting, and a tractor, I don't know. Uh, so, so it just contains something you cannot cut into pieces. Okay, so they decide to use the method of, this is Canaster's uh, algorithm, called the method of sealed bids to divide the estate uh, among themselves. So, so let's see the, the algorithm. Okay, so step one. So the players, A, B, C, each submit a list of bids for the items. So this is uh, very much like the adjusted winner, right? So they first uh, submit a list of bids of the items. So the bid is the value that a player would assign to the items. And this is very important. The bids are done privately and independently. So you don't, like, you don't talk to other people and two of you grouped against the other one. No, that's, so you have to do it privately and independently. So the bid are usually listed in a table. Right? So when you do your homework, uh, you, you see the, the, the table. Right? For example, in this case, so uh, Alice, Betty, and uh, Charles will bid the house of these amounts. Right? Alice will bid uh, this 280,000 and so on and so forth. And then for the painting, and they give different valuations. For example, Betty will say this is 70,000 and so on and so forth. And then this tractor okay, is less valuable, so, so something like this, right? So, so you, you, each, each player submit uh, a list of bids for these items. Right? So that's the first step, okay? So then uh, the second step. So the second step is for each item, the player with the highest bid wins the item. So this is Again, very similar to the adjusted winner, right? So, uh, so the winner, in, in, in this particular example, uh, we are going to use a red uh, to indicate that the item goes to the highest bidder, right? For example, the house, right? A and B give these values, but Charles give 300,000. So he bid with the highest amount, so the house goes to him. Okay, so in, the, in, in this round, in this step. Okay. Similarly, look at the painting. Uh, so among the three person, uh, Alice give the highest bid, so she gets uh, the painting. And then uh, for the third item, again, it's Charles who, who, who got it. So, so that's the second step. Uh, so we, we just started. Okay, so, so the scenario is there are person A, B, C. So they want to uh, divide these items uh, fairly. And then we are going to use an algorithm called the sealed bits. Right? So the, it does the following. So first, everybody must bid. So they must give values uh, in their mind, what are the items worth? Right? So, so you have these things. And then uh, step two will give the item to the person with the highest bid. Okay, so, so, that, so far we are, we are here. Okay. So now, now let's continue. So now step three, so for each player, uh, find the sum of, of his or her bids so this amount is what the player thinks the whole estate worth. Uh, well, let's see this, right? So for example, Alice will give this amount for the house, this amount for the painting, this amount for the tractor. So the, if you add them up, this is Alice's valuation of the total, uh, as, total assets, right? 
So, okay, so this, the amount is what the player thinks the whole estate is worth, okay? So similarly for, for uh, Betty, right? Betty will think the total uh, uh, estate is worth of this amount, and Charles will think of, they are of this amount. Okay, so now <coughs> divide each sum by three, because we have three, three person divided. So divided by three, so this is the fair share that each person think they deserve, right? So, so he think the total value is this amount, he is going to deserve one third of it, right? So he, uh, say, she think she did, this is her fair share. Similarly, Charles will think the, the total value is this, and divided by three, uh, Charles will think he deserves this amount, okay? So we calculate this, okay, so let's, let's see. So for three players, each player is entitled to one third of the estate. So divide each sum by three to get a fair share for each player, so we are here. So remember that each player sees the value differently, so the fair share will not be the same, right? Because this fair share is in the, in, in the individual's eyes. Okay, so now step four, uh, each player either gets more than uh, his or her fair share or less than, right? this, that's, that's by logic. So, so this is obviously true. So we want, to, we want to find the difference between the fair share and the items awarded to the, to the player. So for example, so Alice, will think she deserves this amount, but she only get the painting, right? So she, she would think she deserves an extra this amount, okay? Now same for Betty. Betty think she should get this amount, but she didn't get anything, right? So, so Betty would think she will get this, right? So the, 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 we own her this amount. Now for Charles, he thinks the, his fair share is this amount, but he get, wow, he get a house and together with the third item, so he get a lot. So, so he actually own the, the own us, right? Suppose we are the lawyers or we are the person who help them to divide. So Charles own the, the, the estate this amount. Okay, so, so that's the difference, right? Okay, so then we are going to uh, continue. Right? Okay, so, so if, so this is the step four, right? So first we, we, we find the difference, and then if a player was awarded more than, then the player owns the difference to the, to the estate. If player award less than, then the estate own the player. So let's record it down, right? So here, for Charles, we saw it, right? We saw that he get too, too, too much, right? He, he, he own the estate this amount. Uh, the amount was calculated in the previous slide, okay? Now, for Alice and uh, Betty, the, it's the opposite, right? So the estate own them. Uh, so estate owns Alice this amount, owns Betty that amount. So this is the, the step four. Okay. So, uh, so at this point of the game, there's always some extra money. Uh, wait. Uh, okay. So. Uh, okay. So so let's continue. So, so next step, so at this point, there's always some extra money in the estate called the surplus. So I'll, I'll explain, uh, well, if you have a question, I'll explain why it's always the case. Okay. So to find surplus, we find the difference between all the money owned to the estate and all the money the estate owns. So in this case, it is uh, this amount take away the other amount, sorry. So uh, let's go back to this. So here, 
this is the amount Charles owns to the I state, right? The I state owns the other two person this amount. So the claim is this is always bigger than the sum of these. Uh, so in, in the in, in this example is indeed the case, right? So 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 if you if you do it, you you get this amount. Okay. And then we have to divide the surplus evenly between the three players. So so if you divide it by three, you get seven thousand. Okay. okay. So the last step. So finish the problem by combining the shares of the surplus to either the amount owned to the I state or the amount I state owned, including the item awarded to the to the final share, uh, and also the money. Okay. So 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 what does it say? So so it says Alice. In the end, she'll get this amount plus the surplus. So in the end, uh, she get this. And Betty will get uh, OK. So let's, let's see. So the number was. Uh, Okay, so the S state owns Alice this amount. Now, after divide the surplus, Alice deserves seven thousand more. So therefore, you get the sum of seven thousand plus this, right? And S state owns Betty this amount, but after adding the surplus, another seven thousand, you get uh, where is it? So you get here, you get this. And Charles, originally, he owns the estate this amount, but he is going to get seven thousand. So you you have to take away seven thousand from here, right? So uh, so now Charles owns slightly less, uh, only this amount. Okay. So so these are the calculations for step six. Now the final settlement is is summarized in this table. Okay, so we have seen uh, after the second step, right? So first, the ABC, the players have to provide their bid, right? sealed bid. The second step, the red items goes to the corresponding person, right? And then we calculate the fair share and then determine the, the the whether someone owns the st uh, estate or estate owns someone here. And then based on the figure, you can calculate the surplus. So that is this item minus the sum of the other two items. Okay. So you get a surplus, and then you divide the surplus into uh, evenly for these three person. And then you calculate, OK, so, so estate will own at least the total amount is this. And also, the estate owned Betty total amount is that. And uh, I forgot the dollar sign here. So uh, the Charles will get 7,000 reduced from here. OK? So the final share is this. So Alice will get the painting together with, so after the calculation, he, she will get 69,000 in cash. And Betty get nothing, uh, none of the three items, but she will get lots of money. She will get this amount of money returned to, to her. And Charles will get a house and the third item, but he has to pay the price. He has to pay uh, the total amount of uh, 211000 So that was determined by this number minus the 7000 so that's the final settlement. Okay, so uh, so this is the algorithm uh, using the example. Okay, now I have to I want to convince you that everybody is happy. Okay. So 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 Alice got this, Betty got that, uh, Charles got this. So I want to convince you that everybody is happy. So why? Okay, so let's see the the feature. Uh, okay. We, 
we will not prove anything, but we will just use an example to say that it will be the case. And there is a mathematical theory behind this. It's just beyond our syllabus. Okay. So let's see. So, so how much in the end, what uh, does Alice get? Right? Alice get painting worth this 75,000, and she'll also get certain amount of cash, so the total is this amount, 144, okay. Uh, so, but that is 7,000 more than her fair share, right? So, I, okay. So her fair share, based on her valuation, is 137. But in the end, she got this plus that equal to 144. So she get more than she, uh, the fair share in, in her mind, right? So she should be happy, okay. Now how about Betty? Betty gets this amount cash, right? So again, that is 7,000 more than her fair share, okay? So, uh, we're, uh, so we are here. So Betty would think what she deserves is this amount, right? But there's a surplus. So the surplus is the extra. So she will also be happy. Right? She gets this amount. Now how about uh, Charles? So Charles uh, get a house in his eyes, it was this amount. And also the third item tractor was this amount. But she, he has to pay, right? So, so the, the total share is this. Again, this is 7,000 more than his fair share. So let's, let's go back to the table. Okay, sh he thinks this is the, the fair share, but uh, after he paid this, and you add what he gets, you, the calculation says, right? So after you add these two, take away this, he still have uh, 152,000, and it is more than his uh, fair share. Okay, so he is also happy, right? So at the end of the game, each player end up with more than a fair share, so it always work out this way as long as assumption is satisfied. Yeah. So, so this is the algorithm. Uh, so why, why there's always surplus? Because we always do things based on the highest bidder. So therefore, that that give you the extra surplus. Uh, but we, okay, so we are not talking about theory, so we just look at one example. So, so uh, Now, okay, so this is the first algorithm we are going to see today. Is it all right? So, um, okay, we don't talk about theory, we just look at one example. So, so let, let's quickly go through the steps, right? Maybe with the, the whole thing in mind, you, we can have a better picture. Uh, so let's quickly go, go through the, the, the story one more time. So we want to divide certain things. We can't cut them into pieces. So instead, we, we, we want to use money somehow to make things uh, fair, right? So step one, each player will submit a bid. So we have the table of this, right? So this is step one. Uh, step two, Based on the bid, we pass the the uh, the items. Okay, step two, we, so we'll generate the three red items. So we decide which item goes to which, to, goes to to whom. Okay, step three, we are going to uh, calculate the fair share in each person's mind. So we have to add these bid to get the total and divide by three, because we have three players. So we get this, we, we get this fair share, okay? Now step four, so we have to calculate this, this, uh, who owns who, right? So based on this, uh, step four will say that the state own uh, each person this, and this guy owns state that, okay? And then based on these three figures, Step five, we'll calculate the surplus, okay? So 
So then we divide the surplus evenly in this way. The last step is to uh, add, uh, to, to calculate the, uh, the final settlement uh, in this way. So in the end, you'll get the final settlement. Not only you get this item, and based on the calculation, uh, people will get some cash, or people will pay some cash. Right? So that's the, the whole algorithm of sealed bid. Okay? So at least the step by step is okay, right? In this, this, in this example, this, this is okay. You may ask some other questions, but we can talk uh, during the break or so on. So forth. All right, so now let's move on to uh, another interesting algorithm, right? So, so can't imagine that people really spend lots of effort on, on these. Okay, so 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 here are some argument. Ah, so so then, then this is the last algorithm I'm going to talk about in the fair division. And uh, uh, this part is optional, so it's for fun. Uh, okay. So now uh, the the assumption. Okay, so we want to use a new method. So somehow it's called the method of markers. You will see the reason. Uh, so it's used to divide up a collection of many objects of roughly the same value. So just now we have a house and a painting and something, right? So they are very, very big items and of completely different values. Now here the assumption is, oh, maybe there are situations we have lots of small items. Uh, they, are, they are more or less of the same similar value. So, so the example they give is the jewelry. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, maybe jewelry is more or less the same value. Or, uh, so you have, I don't know, several rings and uh, some, I don't know, diamond. And, and then, okay, so you want to divide them. Okay. So the basic idea of the method is arrange the object in a line. Okay, so, so the first you, 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 you do it in a line. And then each player puts markers between the objects, divide the line of the objects into distinct parts. Uh, each part is a fair share to that particular player. Uh, obviously, I'm going to give you an example, and the things will become very, very concrete, very clear in the example. Okay. So based on the placement of the marker, the objects are allocated to the, to the players. Okay, so, so that's the, the overall picture of this method of markers. So, so let's imagine a scenario. Okay, so we have three players, again, uh, A, B, C. So now it's Albert, Bertrand, and Charles. Okay, Charles is always Charles. So uh, they wish to divide a collection of 15 objects. So we don't care what, what they are, so it's just 15 objects using the method of markers. Okay, so so since there are three players, each player uses two markers, right? To cut uh, a line into three pieces, you only need two cuts. It's like we have seen this to put a certain amount of balls into six boxes, right? So you want to use divider, so you only need five dividers to create six boxes. So this is similar. So you only need two markers to create three segments, right? So, okay. So we will use the notation a sub one to represent the first marker for a, a sub two to re to represent the second marker for a. Right, this is very natural. Okay. okay, so now we have 15 objects here, and then we ask each person to place their markers. So, so for example, Albert will pl place a one here, a two here. Uh, okay, you see the the different color indicates the is there are different objects. So in Arbert's eye, maybe they are of different values somehow, right? So he will put two markers. So the two markers indicates the, in, in Arbert's eyes that these four items is more or less of the same value as these four and is more or less the same value as the tail. 
right? So in his eyes, he can take he he can take any any portion of the three segments. Among the three segments, no matter what you give to him, he he's he's happy. Okay. So the marker divides the line of objects into three pieces. He would be satisfied with any of the three pieces in the final allocation. Right? He said he wants to get one third of these 15 objects. Right? So we asked him to place his marker. So he, he did this. Okay. Now each piece so, uh, of the line is a fair share in Arbor's value system he would be satisfied with any of the three pieces in the final allocation, right? So I'm repeating myself. So, 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 so Albert plays here. So now the player B and player C will do the same, okay? So let's assume they, 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 they place a market like this. So just now we have A1 here, A2 here, right? So maybe B1, B put uh, the marker here and the second marker there and C like this. So, okay, so it's possible, right? So we have something like this. So after they put the markers, we start to allocate. So step one. So we examine the, the items from left to right until we hit the first marker. So in this case, it's B1, right? It, 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 okay, in other cases, it could be A1, it could be C1. But in, in this example, uh, we, we see, 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 A here. This is the first marker. Okay. So then give B all the objects from the beginning of the, uh, the line to the marker B1. So this one, two, three, the three item goes to B, goes to Bertrand. Okay. Now Bertrand removes the rest of markers and leave the game for now. Because uh, later there's some leftover. So Bertrand will return to, to divide the leftover. Uh, so uh, you say, okay, we have this picture after they place their markers. So we go from left to right, find the first marker. Uh, and it turns out to be Bertrand's, right? So then we'll give one, two, three to Bertrand. And then he is temporarily, he, he leave the game, right? So he's second marker is gone also, okay? Okay, so after removing Bertrand's share, so okay, one, two, three was taken by Bertrand, and then the last marker is removed. So we see this picture, okay? Now step two, now continue, we, we go from left to right. But we find, okay, so we want to find the first marker out of the second group of markers. So the second group of markers is the markers with index two. So we move from, from uh, left to right until we find the first marker with the subscript two. Okay, so go, 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 A, here, A2. Okay. So the first marker from this group, in this particular example, it will be A2. Okay, so. So we, we check this. So among the second group of markers, among the markers with subscript two, we find who is the first one. In this example, A2 is the first one. So we are here, okay? And then give Albert all the objects from A1 to A2. Okay, so five, six, seven, eight goes to Albert. And then we, are, we ask Arbor to, to take these items and leave the game for now. Okay. So these four items are gone, and Arbor is gone. So we also read, okay, so, so, that's, so that's a picture. Okay. And then step three, okay, so uh, Charles is the only player left in the game, right? So he, so he considers everything from his second marker to the end on the line to be a fair share, so give these to Charles. Right? So we removed the item eight, right? A2 was here, right? So the second marker of Charles must be after 
after A2. So it must be somewhere here. So we look at the second marker of Charles. Then from here until the end of the, the list, we give these four items to Charles. Okay. Okay, so then any objects not allocated at this point are leftovers, right? So you give these four items to, to Charles, and then the items number four, nine, 10, 11 are still there. So, so these are called leftovers. Okay. okay, so in other words, these are leftovers. Now we have to divide the, the leftover. So, uh, so typically, there will be something left, right? unless the marker are placed so nice that they, they take all. But usually, they will have a situation like that. So then, OK, so the textbook would say, suppose you have lots of leftovers, then you can, you can play the game again. Or if you only have a few like this, well, you just draw lots. Uh, just try your luck with toss or coin, whatever is you, you think is fair. So just do things randomly. So you get something from here. Okay. So the, the three player could draw straws, I don't know, to determine an order, and, uh, and they take the items. Okay. So that's the algorithm in the uh, in, in the example. Okay. So uh, is it clear? Uh, should we? Okay. So let's use the general description as as a, a revision of what we have seen. Okay. So let's let's see. So so. Let's look at the method of markers again. In this case, we, instead of looking at a very, very concrete example with picture, we just describe the algorithm. Right? It's slightly more abstract. OK, so let's see. So now, now I want to describe the method of markers for n players. Just now, there's three players. Now let's assume there's more, right? Like 100 players. OK, okay so. The procedure goes like this. So there are six steps. So this slide has three. The other slide has three. Okay. So first, arrange the object in a line. Okay. And each of the n players plays uh, n minus one markers among the the objects. Right. So just now, three players. Each player put two markers uh, among the objects. So then we go from left to right. So find the first first marker. So first marker means the marker with subscript one. So you f from left to right, you find the first one. Right? So let's assume it's A1. Uh, okay. So give player A, suppose this is A1. Suppose the first marker belongs to Mr. A. So we'll give Mr. A all the objects from the very beginning of the line to the, to the first marker, to the A1. Uh, just now, we did exactly that. Right? So just now, the Mr. A is B, is Bertrand. So we we look at the B1 and then ask Bertrand to take everything to the left of B1. Okay, so so then player B, uh, player A, just now is um, is Mr. B is uh, Bertrand. Uh, so he will remove his remaining markers and leave the game for now. Okay, and then continue. So we look at the first. Second marker. Uh, second marker means uh, we continue check from left to right and look at all the markers with subscript two. Right. So find the first one. Okay. So let's call in the abstract version we call it B two. In the example it was Albert. Right. So it was A two. Okay. So so we, we we find that marker, then give the player B. Suppose it's B. So give the player B all the objects from the first second marker, so from B1 to B2. Okay. And so in other words, all the objects from B1 to B2 goes to, goes to B. And then player B removes his or her remaining markers and leave the game for now. Okay. Now you can imagine what happened to the next, right? So you Continue move from left to right. Look at the first third marker, and then do things. Right? 
So, so find the first third marker. Well, let's say, assume it's C, C, let's say C3. Right? Third marker means the markers with subscript 3. Okay. So now give player C all the objects from the first third marker back to, uh, to C's previous marker C2. Okay. So in other words, all the objects from C2 to C3 uh, give to C. Uh, in our example, there's no such, uh, there's no third marker because we only have two markers each person. But in general, you could have this. Okay, so player C removes his or her remaining markers and leave the game for now. Okay, then dot, 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 right? So here, lots of steps. Continue this pattern until one player remains. Right, so there's only n players, so sooner or later we'll hit him. So give the last player all the objects from his or her last marker to the tail, to the, to the end of the, the objects, right? To the end of the line of the objects. So that's the, the allocation based on the markers. And then the final step is to handle the leftovers, right? So divide up the remaining objects if many objects remain, do the same method. Uh, okay, you can. Uh, if only a few items remains, just randomly choose an order and let each player choose objects and, until the objects are gone. This is, yes, this is proportional, yes. Okay, so. Uh, You can, uh, yes, but uh, but this is uh, how to say. Uh, sorry, the the question was, can we use sealed bits? Uh, you can, I think you can, right? But uh, the how to say the intention for this uh, markers is is to see that somehow uh, sorry, what I'm trying to say. So I'm I'm presenting two algorithms. So the intention is maybe the different algorithm can apply to different not so similar situations, right? So the sealed bid probably works well for those house and painting, uh, maybe one or, I mean, few items. And for the, for the marker, you have to have lots of things. Otherwise, there's not even place to, to, to put the markers, right? Suppose you have three players, only two items. The, the gaps, are only one gap, so it's very hard to to place a marker. So usually it's a long list of things and then you ask people to place markers. Okay, so that's, that's uh, I don't know, I think, I'm not sure, I, I'm not, uh, 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 I don't know whether in real life people actually use these algorithms. I mean, I like this because it's, it's mathematical. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting so that people can think of something like this so that theoretically things are proportional or, or unbe free or so so it's it's nice right but i I don't know whether in real life uh, people maybe you should talk to a lawyer and say are you going uh, have you ever used this sealed bit to to help client to divide uh, i don't know so Yes, yes. So, otherwise, you would have what? Things will. Uh, suppose you have. Uh, A very thing, and then, then, then it's hard to. Yes. So, so I don't know. So, suppose let's see. So, in the long line, maybe. So, uh, what do you want? So, you want the first. Suppose first one is super, super valuable. Then. Then you can't divide. So, so the, the, so, suppose you have rooms to, to put markers, means that the values are more or less spread out, right? So, suppose, suppose this guy has, the, the item one is like one million, all others one dollar, and then there's no way to, to put them into to, uh, three pieces. So, so the assumption is they are more or less the same value. Uh, some textbook use uh, dividing candies, right? So we cut cakes, 
but here is like dividing candies. So I don't know. So maybe you have some Mars bars, or you have some other brand uh, sneakers, and so 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 they are more or less the same value, and then you want to divide them. Uh, so so that's the the, the scenario. Yes, yes. Okay, any other questions? Good, so, uh, so you will see some examples uh, of sealed, bit, sealed bits in the, in the tutorial. And I didn't give tutorial for this, but you can, you can try. Uh, so, so that's the, the end of the topic of fair, sh uh, fair division. So let's take a break, and then we move on to a new topic, completely new topic, uh, uh, graph theory. So, uh, uh, so we are slightly ahead of time. So let's take a short break, and then we can come back. When we come back, we talk about this, uh, this graph theory.
Jeff, what is a sealed bid? Why does it happen? And what does a buyer do if faced with that situation? Um, a sealed bid, Richard, is where all potential buyers for a property put their bids in by a certain pre-agreed date and time. Uh, the bids are sealed, so no one knows what they are, and they're revealed to the vendor um, after the agreed time. Um, why would a vendor do that? Well, because a vendor wants to maximise the return on their property, uh, and for a buyer, they really need to, need to put themselves in the best position when making that sealed bid, so have their mortgage ready, um, a solicitor ready in place, and make the best bid that they feel is uh, possible on that particular property. Okay, so once those sealed bids are in, what, what's the process? What happens? Well, they're sealed, so no one sees the bids, uh, not even the agent, until that they're opened uh, when that's agreed with the vendor at a, uh, a pre-agreed time. Um, and the, the benefit of that is it helps the vendor maximise their return on the property and also make an informed decision as to who is actually the best buyer for their property. Okay, so uh, we can continue. Uh, just now, uh, there's people point out that there's a duplication of items, so, so I don't know why. Uh, uh, maybe I cut and paste one more time or something. So there's no particular meaning. Okay, forget this. Okay, okay so. Uh, uh, Yes, just now there are some uh, some people telling me that seal speed was actually used in real life. Uh, so that's why I, I, I try to Google it. And s well, uh, that particular YouTube doesn't help, uh, but maybe there you can find more interesting applications. Uh, I, I don't even know the YouTube the piece I, I just played is the same sealed bid as ours. Uh, so maybe it refers to something else, but all under the same name, sealed bit. Uh, uh, maybe you can try this canaster uh, uh, algorithm or something like that. Anyway, so so we, we move on to the, uh, the next topic, uh, which is graph theory. Oh, by the way, we are, we are very close to the, to the end, right? So we have a few more weeks. So the the plan is probably uh, okay. Definitely, we'll cover several subtopics in graph theory, and then we'll talk about something about uh, uh, crypto or the coding and how to uh, either involve some number theory, some some uh, I don't know, some calculation. Uh, so, and then uh, it depends on. The time. So if I have more time, I'll, 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 I'll cover something extra. Uh, the last week, uh, the week 13, I'm going to uh, to just answer the past year exams, right? So like like what we did for the for midterm, I will upload the uh, exam paper set by Professor Gan Gan Vitek, Tech, um, and then you can use it as to, to practice, and then week 13, I will use the lecture hour to uh, to answer those, uh, uh, to, to tell you the solutions. And also, if you have questions, you, you, you should ask me in week 13. Um, I guess uh, for those of you who are, who somehow has the previous, uh, or the, the notes from last semester, you will see that uh, actually we covered less than, than Professor Ken, so. Um, but I'm happy if you, you master all the materials of these. Uh, I, I, think I, I think some of the topics are interesting, and, and hopefully it's new to you, okay? Oh, since we are, <laughs> we, are, we are talking about uh, uh, these kind of things, 
I would ask you to uh, give me suggestions. Uh, okay, you can tell me in person or if you are watching a webcast, you can email me. So I, okay, so this is my first time to teach this, uh, this course. So lots of topics I don't know <laughs> whether it's interesting or it's suitable. So if you know some interesting topics or if you wish to know some interesting topics, you can email me, right? So because uh, people here are from engineering, from, uh, from I don't know, most of, most of people I talk to, they are all from engineering. Some of, some of you are from science. Uh, mm, uh, so if you know that in engineering there are some interesting topics, right? So, so it would be nice to cover those. Then let me know, right? So, so if you know some, some topic which are very nice in social sciences, right? Like those voting, or, or from economy, or from, I don't know, from art, from architecture. Uh, so give me some suggestions, email me, right? And then I think uh, everybody will, will get benefit, right? Suppose, suppose I'm going to teach it again, the future student will see those interesting topics too, right? So I, I will also learn something new, okay? So please do give me suggestions of possible topics. Okay, so, uh, so now let's continue. Okay, so we are talking about graph theory. So almost all the graph theory book will mention this story. So I, that means you probably have heard it more than 10 times, but, uh, but we, people always start from here. So this is the birth place of graph theory, okay? So, so here, so the question is, uh, this is probably real. So uh, there's a place called Konigsberg. Now it's called uh, Kaliningrad. Uh, so it's, uh, it's somewhere in, uh, uh, it's not connected to, to, to Russia, but belong to Russia. In the past, it belonged to uh, Prussia and Okay, so anyway, so this is a famous city, and uh, I don't know whether, whether you know the philosopher Kant. Uh, so he's, the, the, he spent his whole life there, uh, never traveled to any other places. And also, uh, I'm a logician, I'm a mathematical logician, so we mentioned the name of Gödel, right? Gödel, uh, Herbert, uh, so Gödel has his famous incompleteness theorem. So he, Gödel, announced his, uh, okay, he gave a talk about his completeness theorem, and also in the discussion, he, he announced he has this incompleteness theorem also in Königsberg. So Königsberg supposedly is, I don't know, from these events, it, it must be a fantastic city to visit. Unfortunately, I've never been there, right? Uh, I don't know whether some of you have been there. Uh, okay, so I hope before I die, I could, uh, I could uh, go there once. And then I'll take some real pictures and see whether, uh, it is said that the, the, the bridge are no longer there, but uh, anyway, so, okay, so, so come back. So, so there is a fantastic city called Kunisberg. And in the uh, 1700, uh, so, uh, the legend goes that after dinner, people will walk around in the city, and then there's uh, canals and there are seven bridges. Uh, so when they walk through these bridges, they want to know. So they, they try to, to do this. They try to walk around the city and crossing each of the, the seven bridges exactly once, right? So you, you start somewhere, and then you, 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 you travel around, walk around, you get a pass or get a walk, whatever. And then the question is, is it possible that you travel and pass each bridge exactly once? So that's the, the, the curious question, right? So people from Königsberg, they, they do this. Okay, so, uh, so the question is, is it possible? Okay, so then, uh, so this is a real life question, and then somehow Euler, uh, the, our next uh, slides will show. So Euler, okay, so here, 
So this is a, a better map than this, right? Ignore all the irrelevant things, you get this. So there are seven bridges here, right? So then, uh, okay, it turns out, so Euler solved the problem, and incidentally, he, he invented graph theory, okay? So he think of this picture as a graph, right? So the, the dot here represent each of the green areas. Okay, for example, this, this dot here represent this green area in the middle. And the, the other three green areas are these three. So the, the, we call it edges. So the, these line segment or curve link one area to another. So this is the bridge, right? So this is representing the bridge. So from this vertex, there are two bridges connecting to the other green area. So you have two edges coming out from this connected to the other, right? So this smaller, we call it graph, represent the map of the seven bridges. Okay, so now Euler studied this graph instead of actually walking around in Königsberg. Okay, okay here's Euler. Uh, so he is one of the best mathematicians ever. Uh, so uh, he's a Swiss uh, and died in St. Petersburg. Uh, you probably have seen Euler formula, Euler this, Euler that, right? So, so uh, in his late uh, life, he become blind, but he can still do fantastic math in, all in his mind. So he can. Uh, so this is this is a genius. Okay. So Euler. Okay. You should remember the, the name. Okay. So so now so now we want to turn this problem into a graph theory problem. So that's the the birth of the graph theory. So uh, here's the definition. So you call the Euler walk or Eulerian. I don't know. So Eulerian. I, I, I don't know how to say. It. I just say Euler walk. Okay. So here's the definition. So an Euler walk in a graph is a walk that use every edge in the graph exactly once. So it's like you cross the bridge exactly once, right? Remember that in this, in this picture, the bridge here was represented by the edge. You travel the edge exactly once, right? So the Euler walk is a graph how uh, of work in a graph is a work that uses every edge in the graph exactly once. So, so the inspiration is to cross a bridge exactly once. Okay. Now, therefore, a, a close Euler walk. Uh, so, this I'm introducing these names. Uh, this is awkward. So, we are usually people usually say Euler circuit is an Euler walk that starts and ends at the same vertex. So you walk around and then you return to the, the starting point. Now it's also possible that you, uh, you, you can travel each edge once, but in the end you end up at a different place. So that's called the open Euler walk. So the open Euler walk is an Euler walk that starts and ends at different uh, vortices. Vortices are those, are, are these blue dots are called vortices. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think most of people will, will not question this definition, right? But somehow uh, <laughs> mathematicians like to, to give exact definition of everything. So, so before we proceed, I think I can proceed here, from here. Uh, people will, although I didn't define what is an edge, what is a graph, you probably will have an intuitive understanding of what is an edge, what is a vertex. But, uh, okay, so let's, let's be more mathematical. So let's, let's, let's spend some time on, on these uh, definitions which are very, very intuitive. Uh, okay, I, I think you have no, no uh, difficulty to understand all of them. Okay. So here, so what is a graph, right? So mathematically, 
a graph is a collection of points and lines connecting some pair of the points, right? So, so let me finish this and then use the example. So the points are called vertices. So uh, I'm not English educated, so I have to remind myself the singular form of vertices is vertex, okay? So the line joining any two vertices are called edges, right? So for example, here, so there are five vertices uh, the hand doesn't count, right? So A, B, C, D, E. So uh, there are five vertices. The edges are, so the, you can connect some of them, right? So A, B is an edge, B, D is an edge, B, E, uh, B, E is an edge, and C, D, C, E, and D, E, right? So this, this is a graph. So the graph will consist of two, two components. One is vertices, the other one is edges. Right. So once I tell you what are the vertices and how they connect, I'm giving you a graph. Okay. So uh, okay. So there are lots of small definitions. So the the a graph like this is called the undirected graph because the edges are are two ways. It's not like you can only go from A to B, uh, then never come back. You cannot come back. Uh, Next week, we are going to, to define the directed graphs. But uh, from this particular example, A, B, and B, A make no difference. Uh, you can go this way, you can go that way. It's like you cross a bridge, you can cross this way, you can, you can walk back. It's not like one-way bridge. Okay. Well, so, so there are lots of, lots of small things, but uh, it, it doesn't bother us too much. Okay. okay, so you can also draw it, okay, you can draw it, so the graph doesn't depend on how you draw it. The only thing important are the vertices and the edges. As long as the vertices are the same, say you have five vertices, I have five vertices. And also the way we connect are the same, right? If you connect these two vertices, I also connect these two vertices. Then they are the same graph. It doesn't depend on how I draw it. For example, you can draw the same graph, so, so these are same graph. Uh, you can draw it like this. Uh, I don't, uh, the source somehow write uh, this, this funny curve. Right? In real life, people never draw this like that. Right? People usually draw just one line. Okay, so, so, so these and, and this one are the same graph. Okay, because you see here I connect A to B, right? Here I also connect A to B. So it doesn't, it doesn't depend on how I draw it. Right? Okay. So uh, also, if uh, so, the two vertices that are joined by the edge are called adjacent vertices. Right. So this this is again very very intuitive. Uh, what else are you going to call them? Right. Adjacent. They are neighbors. Okay. And some, uh, somehow we want to talk about uh, these kind of funny. Uh, edges. This is called a loop. It starts and ends at the same point. And also, uh, we, c we can talk about multiple edges. So between two vertices, you can have more than one right, uh, edges. This is called multiple edges. Uh, for example, in the Konigsberg Bridge, you have multiple edges because you could have two bridges connecting the two areas. So, right? so, so sometimes they consider this. But most of the time, people will just consider this. Uh, it's called simple graph. So the graph without loops and without multiple edges are called uh, uh, simple graph. Uh, but it's just names. Okay, okay so example. Uh, so. Uh, people try to say that graph theory is very, very useful, so sometimes they use some examples. Uh, okay, so, so here is, so they talk about Facebook. I, I never use Facebook, so I don't know, maybe you are more familiar. So Facebook has lots of users, including most of you. Okay, so I check, so on the textbook, it gave a figure, so I, I just Google it, it gave a much, much bigger figure uh, in 2018. The textbook was a few years old, so so it's, it's much less. Anyway, so, 
so uh, Facebook is a huge company. And uh, okay, so if, if, if Facebook were a country, it would be very big, okay? So, uh, okay, it's translated into many, many languages, and uh, okay, so there are lots of, lots of uh, people use it, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, okay, so, but we can study something. We can represent uh, Facebook as a graph. So we can think of it as a graph. So if I do this, so the vertices are the, the users, and the edges are some kind of connections between the users. I guess you are more familiar with this, so I don't know, you can have friends or whatever, so, so then it's a, you can connect some of the users in, in, by some edges, right? So now this graph will help us to, to study something, right? For example, it can help us determine whether someone is more influential. So suppose he has lots of connections in this graph, then he is more influential than someone was isolated and no connection, right? Okay, anyway, so this is an artificial example. Well, let's, in order to talk about, to go back to the Euler uh, situation, to the, to the bridges, I need to introduce these things. Uh, so uh, a walk, what is a walk on the graph? Uh, what is a path on the graph? What is a cycle? What is the so-called degree of a vertex? Uh, the first three things you can guess. Cycle will be like a cycle. It's like, right? Uh, the last one uh, is very easy, so I'll, I'll, I'll introduce in a second. Okay, so what is a walk? So a walk on a graph is just a sequence of vertices and edges in a graph such that the sequence alternates between vertices, and, oh, so these are all, okay. It's accurate, but <laughs> too, too, too much. Uh, starting and ending with the same vertices. And each edge in the sequence joins the vertices that occurs immediately before and after it in the sequence. I'll give you an example, it'll become completely clear. Uh, these are too wordy. Uh, so a walk that starts and ends at different places is called an open walk. A work that starts and ends at the same vertex, vertex is called a closed work. Uh, a work contains no repeated vertices and edges is called a path. Uh, we'll see the example. Right? Look at this. So this is a graph. Right? There are five vertices. How many edges? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven edges. Now, what is a work? Okay, so it's a sequence of uh, vertices and edges, right? So A followed by AB, and then you are at B. And B followed by BC, and you are at C. C followed by CE, you are, get, you are at E, right? Then EB, uh, and you are at B, and then BD, you are at D. So this is a walk, right? So it's very, very, very intuitive. This is a walk starting from A and ending at D, right? So you, you, you do these things, and then you are at D. So uh, this is too, too long, right? So we can simply write it at A, B, C, E, B, D. Is it true? So A go to B, B go to C, C go to E, E go to B, and go to D. So these are indicating the same thing, right? Okay, so we understand, right? Okay, so now uh, you can have a close work here. So let's, let's, let's see whether we understand this. A to B to C, to B, or oh, go back to B, and then to E, and back to A. So this is a closed walk, right? So this is, again, a sequence of edges and uh, vertices, but it returned to the starting point. So this is a closed walk, okay? Uh, and in, in this example, you travel the edge, edge BC twice, right? You, here you go B to C, and then you go from C to B. So you travel it twice, so this is, it has uh, repetition of what, uh, both vertices and also have repetition of edges, right? So this is, again, very, very obvious. Now, what are the examples of a path? A path will have no repetition of vertices, no repetition of edges. So a path, for example, here, let's see, is it path? A, E, B, D, right? So A to E, E to B, B to D. So this is a path. Right, so it's just, just like that. Okay. Now, cycle. You can imagine, 
what kind of things are like cycles. A cycle in a graph is a closed walk in which the only repetition is the first and last vertex. Right? So let's see an example. So, so uh, this, the, this, sorry, the, I so alert means the, the red. So the length of the walk is defined as the number of edges in the walk, uh, including repetitions. So for example, uh, so in, in this graph, you have three cycles of length four. Is it true? Okay, let's, let's see whether the, the three examples are correct. So A to B, B to C, C to E, E to A. So this is a, okay, it's a cycle, it's a closed walk. Right, so it's a cycle of lengths, okay, one, two, three, four, right? So it's just like, uh, let's check one more and then, then we had enough. So A, B, D, E, A. A, B, D, E, A. Okay, so again, this is a closed walk with lengths four. So no, repeat, no, except A, there's no repetition of vertices, right? So, so this is a cycle of lengths four. Okay, and there's another one I think you can check. Okay, now a mathematical challenge, uh, the same picture. Okay, I want to convince you there is no cycle of lens five. Uh, sometimes we just say it for five cycles. Uh, f five cycles, not, not cycles, five cycles. So, so you cannot find uh, in this graph, there is no cycle of lens five. Well, uh, it's very easy, right? Because, so uh, I mean, this is just an example. We try to, uh, we try to help us understand the words. The, the, okay, so any five cycle means cycle of lens five. Any cycle of lens five must contain five vertices, right? So this is easy. So, so it must contain all the five. Now, in particular, it will contain A and C and D. That's sure, because it contains everybody. So it, it must contain A, C, and D. But what are so special about A, C, and D? So if you enter, you have to go out, right? So if you, are, if you arrive at A, the only way to arrive at A is you travel EA and then uh, either EA or BA, right? So if you, vis if you visit A, C and D, you have to visit these pair of edges, A, B, A, E, or B, C, and C, E, or B, D, and D, E. Right? Otherwise, there's no way to enter, uh, right? So you have to hit six edges, right? But any five cycle, any cycle with lens five cannot have lens six, so, so that's the simple argument. Anyway, so the, this is not important, but it, I mean, it try to help us to understand what is the cycle of lens five. Okay, so the last item in the, in the list is degree. So the degree of a vertex in a graph is the number of edges that occur at that vertex uh, with every loop counts at two. Okay, so, so the notation D of V represents the degree of a vertex. Okay, so example. So in this example, so the degree count how many edges are connected to this vertex. The A, for, for example, here A, you have two. So degree of A, you have two edges connected to A. So you have the degree of A is two. Degree of B, one, two, three, four, right, because there are four edges connected to B. Okay. Now, uh, so so and, and so on and so forth. Right. For example, E will have degree four. Okay. So the complication is: uh, suppose you have a loop here, you count as one or two, and okay, the definition says if you have a loop, it counts as two. Okay. So anyway, so so that's the degree. Uh, there is a small theorem, and uh, okay, so let's use this as a practice for degree. So it says in any graph, the sum of all the degrees is equal 
to twice of the number of edges. So in particular, the sum of all degrees must be even. If you add all the, all the degrees, okay, so let's see, is this true? Okay, ah, no, here everybody has even degree, so, so it doesn't. Uh, okay, so the proof is one line. So why, why the sum of all degrees is equal to twice of the edges? Because every edge contributes uh, twice to the sum of all degrees, right? So the, the edge will con connect two vertices, V1, V2. So when you look at the degree of V1, you count it once. You look at the degree of V2, you count it once. So every edge counted twice, so, so the result follows, right? So, so this is very simple. Okay, good. So now we can go back to, to talk about the Euler. So, so let's recall, so uh, an Euler walk in a graph is a walk, now the walk has a specific meaning, right? It doesn't mean we walk around, okay? So a walk that uses every edge in the graph exactly once. Okay, so that's an Euler walk. Okay, so uh, we first consider, uh, I think I can delete the, the, the word simple. Uh, so we first consider undirected graphs. Uh, so again, I should delete her first, uh, I don't know why. Okay, so, so look at this example. So we have a graph like this. So what is an Euler, what's an example of Euler circuit? So Euler circuit is an Euler walk, but it has to start, uh, start and end at the same place, right? So, so uh, I will not list the, the, the walk, but if you look at the, uh, Okay, so we, we can, can, can you see uh, all the circuit from, from uh, sorry, the, probably this is not very accurate. Okay, so how do we get an uh, Euler uh, circuit? Let's say start from A. Is it easy? So you can do, okay, let's try. Uh, okay, so what, what did I, okay, so A to B, B to F, F to G, G to B, B to C, uh, okay, C to G, G to E, E to C, C to D, D to E, and E to F, F to A, is it right? Oh, you can try. You can try. You can. You can. You can. Uh, uh, it's not unique. You can. You can uh, have lots of options. Uh, okay. Anyway, so you can. You can have. Sorry, I have to modify. The, there are too many typos. Okay. So now, what is Euler's contribution? So he proved a theorem saying that in order to have uh, Euler circuit, the graph must have certain property. But the Königsberg, the bridge, the, the graph induced by the, by the bridges does not have that property. Okay, so let's see what are the properties. So here, this is the, the theorem uh, by Euler. So, so Euler says this, so a connected graph. Uh, I didn't define what is connected graph, but you can imagine. So it's one piece. It's, there's no isolated points or there's no two graph that one's here, the other one's here. There's no edge connected. So, so connected graph is just one piece, just, just the usual graph you would think, okay? So a connected graph has an Euler circuit if and only if the degree of every vertex is even. Uh, we just define degree, right? So if you look at a, any vertex, you count how many edges are connected to the vertex. It must be even. Right? So it says uh, the graph has an Euler circuit, then every vertex must have even degree. And then this is, ah, this is a wonderful word, if and only if, so it's both ways. 
right? So if every vertex has even degree, then there is a, a orbital circuit. Does this guy, everybody has even degree? Hopefully yes, right? Otherwise I, I did something totally nonsense. Okay, so this is, okay, let's follow the alphabetical order. Degree two, degree four, degree four, degree two, degree four, degree four, degree four, right? So every vertex in this graph has even degree. The degree is even number. So it has, definitely has order circuit, okay. And how about not a circuit, but just an open, open Euler walk? So a connected, graph, a connected graph has an Euler walk starting at vertex A and ending at vertex B. A B is not A, otherwise it's a circuit. If and only if, again, this logical word, if and only if A and B have odd degrees and everybody else, every other vertex has even degrees. So these are only two exceptions. The starting point and end point are the only two exceptions. Uh, so in this case, you can draw a line. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can have a, a walk traveling uh, each edge exactly once. Okay? So the remaining five minutes, I'm going to prove this. Uh, as you know, proof is always optional. So, uh, okay. But it's, it's fun. This, this is actually very easy. So the proof is based on this principle. <laughs> what goes in must come out, right? So, so that's why you have even number, right? So you, you enter, this is once, but you have to go out. So, so it has to, to even, even out, right? You cannot have single, single way to enter. Right? Suppose you enter without going out, you must be the end point. Right? So, so, so the reason is like that. Uh, but uh, uh, let's do some mathematics, right? So here, uh, let me remind you what is if and only if. So we want to show this, that, uh, the, the statement one, two are of the form uh, P if and only if Q, right? So actually, this is a double arrow, right? It, it means this, P implies Q and Q also implies P. So if you have this, you must have that. You have that and that, this, right? So. Okay, so now in our context, P is, uh, I'll just prove A. I think that will have enough. Then. So P will be, it has an oil circuit. Q will be every vertex of even degree. So I want to show P implies Q and also Q implies P. Right, this is what I want to convince you. Okay, so here. So first, I want to show P implies Q. So first we show P, P uh, implies Q, right? So we assume P is true. Assume the, there is an Euler circuit in the graph. I, I, I want to, we show that all vertices have even degrees, okay? Well, imagine to trace a walk starting at vertex A using a red color, a red pencil. Every time you visit uh, vertex C, different from A, during your walk, you enter the vertex using an edge and leaves using an unused edge, right? Because you can only travel each edge exactly once. If you enter using this edge, you have to leave using another edge, right? Unused, because you can only use it once, okay? So, so here, so each visit to a vertex result in a pair of edges being colored red. Right, so, that, so this is a, a long way of saying go in. What goes in must go out. Right, so you can pair them, the, the, the edge you, you enter and the edge you leave. Okay? Now, so if you visit vertex C n times during your walk, you will have color 2n edges incident to, a, to, to C red. Right? Okay, so since every edge is used exactly once, uh, so the degree of C is, is 2n. So, okay. So it, it's it's uh, even. Now you can apply the same logic to the starting point. So, the only exception is you you leave at the first place and you return at the last place. So, so all others are the same. So that shows every degree has to be even. Right? Let me repeat. So essentially, it just says what goes in has to go out. That's that's that's. So you pair them up. And therefore, every 
you can pair everything. Okay. Now the other direction is more interesting. Uh, so if you have a question about this, uh, you can ask me after class. Okay. Uh, I'm, I have two more minutes. So. Okay, so, so, so let's show the other direction. So we want to show Q implies P, right? So that is, suppose this is Q. Every vertex have even degrees, have degree of even number, right? Now we try, so you have, we have to get P, which is we have to have an Euler walk, okay? So here's our, our construction. So we choose any, any, anywhere. We choose a vertex A. And then we just, just do whatever you want to do. Okay? So you go out to another vertex A, B. Or you go here. Right? Now B has, has degree even. Now, except this funny edge, right? you, you, you enter from here, so you erase it. Now B must have an odd number of edges available. Right? So, so the, 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 the edge you travel, you just travel, is not available anymore. So you have, but luckily B is of even degree, so there must be something left. There are some odd number of edges left. So, so there is always one available you can go out. Okay? So you just go out from that one. I don't care which one you go. Okay? So then you, you, go, you go from B to another vertex. Uh, Okay, so so you, you you just you just try your luck. Just just follow this. Okay, so now since the number of edges is finite, so we have to return a eventually, right? So you you just try your luck, and then maybe accidentally you return to the starting point. Okay, so maybe you do a to b, and then go somewhere and do c, and then in the end you hit a. Right, so it's possible. Now, if this exhausts all the edges, wow, this is lucky, right? So I didn't even plan that, but I finished the task. Uh, so, so then we are done. Well, life is more complicated. So if not, well, since the graph is connected, there must be an unused edge, right, connected to some vertex x to uh, on the walk. If uh, so, we can then start from. Suppose this is x, right? So then you can start from x. Try your luck. Do this. Do the same thing. You try your luck, and then you are going to hit to return to x. So you can start from x, moving along the unused edges, and construct another close walk. So x goes to y and go to somewhere else and come back to x. Right. Without using whatever you have traveled. Okay. Okay, so now now what? Now we have two two circuits. One is from A to A, just now, the, the one we try our luck. The other one is the second. Uh, you go from x and then to this. Okay. So the trick is you can combine the two walks into a bigger walk, right? You cut and paste. You insert this part to X, so you get this. So A, B, C, go to X. Instead of going to B directly, you take your detour and then come back to X, then go to D, right? So you can, you can, you can do this. And then <laughs> continue this way, right? So if this finish everything, we are done. If not, there must be some edges coming out from somewhere, and then you, uh, you continue this way. So you end up with uh, all the work, right? So, so that finishes the proof of one. Uh, so we, everybody has even degree, so you can start from anywhere and always come back. Now, the proof of two is similar, but you have to start from the odd degree one, and then in the end you finish at the other odd degree one. Okay, so okay, so so that's all uh, for today. So next time we'll, so next week we are, we'll continue the topic of graph theory. Okay, so that's all. <laughs>